Years ago, back when your mom kicked you out of the house after breakfast and you didn't have to come home until your tummy rumbled, my neighbor and I came across a very grim discovery in the woods that we used to play in sometimes. We were only around nine or 10 and the highlight of our Saturdays would be making dens in the tree houses in those same woods. It was never anything fancy, but just a lot of fun, back when our world was pretty innocent still. We would occasionally find things in the woods that blew our minds, but it was never anything scary. The odd beer can, a pack of smokes, once an adult magazine where the ladies looked nothing like our mothers. That all changed the day we found something grim. A body, to be exact. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't a King coming-of-age story, and we didn't go looking for it like Stand By Me. And it wasn't so much a body. I'm getting ahead of myself. We had arrived in the woods as usual and headed straight over to the latest area that we had tried our best to build a den in. Not that we had a mean for older kids knocking it down or anything. I think they would be too cool for that. It was just more nature and weather. The closer we got, the more we started to notice a really nasty smell. Sometimes, we would come across a pile of animal dung, and although it was always gross, this was their home, and we were the visitors. But this smelt worse than anything we've ever smelt. Do we got skunks moving in? I remember asking my friend, whom I'll call Scotty for this story. As we arrived by the den, we discovered what was causing the stench. A large pile of still steaming guts. I'm not gonna lie. My first thought was who had left a load of bloody sausages. And that's kind of what it looked like. Upon closer inspection though, from the rancid stink, we came to the terrifying conclusion that it was in fact somebody's entrails. Once we had reached that assumption, my friend bent over and tossed his cookies, so to speak. I didn't blame him. I wasn't feeling too hot myself. That's when we heard it. A growl. There was no doubt in either of our minds that it was indeed a growl. We both sort of sat there, frozen in fear. All the years we'd been coming in here, and the most we'd seen were a few bunnies and the odd woodchuck. Plenty of birds, but never something that would emit a growl. Where's it coming from? Whispered my friend, looking about ready to lose the rest of whatever it is that he had for breakfast. I was scanning the area around us, trying to source where the growl was. It sounded to be a dog or a wolf, and it was very low to the ground especially when they were feeling threatened or hunting. I knew that from watching nature documentaries on TV, which is why I was surprised when we heard the growl again, and it seemed to be coming from much higher than ground level, more like above our heads. That's when we saw them, and by them, the eyes. The eyes of what looked to be a hairy snout, at the level of a tall adult person. That was enough. We booked it and refused to go back into those woods for the weeks following. I'll never know exactly what we saw. Common sense tells me at the very least, the entrails were far more likely to be that of a deer, which there were plenty of black-tailed deer further in the woods where the trees were a lot more denser and closer together. But even now as an adult, who questions everything. I still have no logical explanation as to why we saw a man-sized dog hiding up in those trees. A couple of years ago, I went to a bachelor party in Vegas. Since we were going to be spending all of our dollars on casinos and drink, we didn't stay on the strip itself, opting for a way cheaper venue a little behind all the bright lights. It was clean, 
and to be honest, we only needed it for the bed and bathroom. Because it was set a little ways back, rather than overlooking the back of the big hotels, our room faced a vast expanse of land that was apparently intended to be built upon or turned into a gold course or something. But for now, it was empty and dark. You could see the lights of the city and the suburbs, but the parking lot and this huge open area was pretty dark. One night, I hadn't had as much to drink as the others, as I'd had a slight stomach upset. Whether from the sheer amount of alcohol in my system, or the dodgy seafood, I don't know. But it is relevant here that I was not wasted. In fact, I was more sober than anything else. Having come back early to the hotel, I stepped onto the balcony for a smoke before hitting the sleep sack. I could hear this horrendous noise coming from the land behind the parking lot, like a mixture between a howl and a yelp. I honestly thought there must be a wounded coyote out there, and kind of felt sorry for it. It sure sounded like it was groaning and moaning in pain. As I was finishing off the last of my cigarette, I heard the noise again, and it sounded a little closer now. By now, I was just hoping it wasn't going to crawl into the parking lot and make a mess. One of the security lights at the perimeter of the lot suddenly came on, and I think at that point, I yelled a little in fright. Because, although there was some distance between us, thank God, I could truly see what was making that damn awful noise, and it wasn't no coyote. At least, not a regular one. You see, this thing, and I call it thing because I have no idea what else you would classify it as. It was standing upright, on two legs, not like a regular coyote would, and not like a dog on four legs. And I can remember that it was very tall. It was leaning up against that right chain fence and was howling. Well, you can bet I finished that smoke and ran right back inside the hotel room, making sure the balcony was locked, as well as every window and door in the room. Curtains drawn, lights off. I don't know what the hell was out there, but there was no way that was just a coyote. Could it have been somebody in a costume? Well, I'm not too sure. It didn't look like somebody in a Hollywood suit. It looked far too large and realistic for that. I'm not saying there's such a thing as werewolves, but what I am saying is what I saw, I can't really explain. It still creeps me out writing this to you. I have heard many stories involving dogmen over the years. The Beast of Bray Road is quite fascinating, but that's all they ever were to me. Just stories. So... I have been desperately trying to rationalize what the hell I saw lying in the road the other day, and I just could not find a good explanation. It wasn't a dark and stormy night, not like a lot of stories you hear that go on and on and claim to be truth, but are blatant creepypasta garbage. It was coming up towards the evening time, but it was more like dinner time and I wasn't on some abandoned stretch of road that nobody dares to go down or driving through the spooky woods. No, I was on the highway. Admittedly, this particular route was in no way busy, and I barely saw another car as I drove steadily home from work that day. It was that kind of time of day and year where the sun wasn't exactly burning bright in the sky, but you didn't need your headlights on yet either and that was when I saw something lying in the road. Now, although it shouldn't be a valid excuse, I am female, and therefore I know I need to protect myself. I'm also kind of short, and do not carry a firearm. But at that moment, I wasn't thinking this was some kind of elaborate kidnap ruse. I thought an animal had been run over. Nearing the thing, it sure seemed to be the case. 
and it was very still, and I noted huge. The closer I got to it, the more details I could vividly see. In fact, due to the sheer size and shape of the body, I had begun to doubt it being an animal, and was now concerned with this being some kind of body dumped, and whether I could get away with calling 911 as I sped away in absolute terror. I was approaching it, so the feet came into view first. Then, I slowly got the full view of what exactly was lying there. The best way I can describe it is that it was a tall, hairy human wearing a dog's face. Does that make any sense? Because it sure didn't to me. As I said before, I love listening to podcasts and watching shows about creatures and cryptids and stuff. But until now, I thought it was all just BS. You know, meant for fun. Just fun stuff people can make up for entertainment. I remember, I put my foot on the gas and sped off, as fast as my little car would go. Looking in the rearview mirror, I could still see the body just lying there in the road. But something tells me there was something else there, that this thing wasn't actually dead, that perhaps, maybe, it was just a trap to get me out of my car. Although I had only gotten a fleeting glance, there didn't seem to be any blood or apparent injuries to it. It was just lying there, unmoving, undisturbed, if it was alive. I was so scared when I got home. I didn't know what to do. I know people often say to face your fears, and the only thing I could think of was hitting Google and seeing if other people here around the area, Northern California, have had similar experiences as I. And that's when I found out that what I was seeing was being a popular story for fans of the X-Files. There's a whole lot of sightings, real sightings about the thing that I'd just seen too. I kept looking out in the news for any strange reports over the next following weeks, but I never saw or heard of anything. I can't be the only person to see this, nor do I believe I was the only person that day to see it on the road, just lying there. I wonder if this is somehow being covered up, or at least hushed in the news from not being out further. Like I said, I just have this distinct feeling that I can't quite quelch. Like had I gotten out of the car, I just feel like maybe, just maybe, it was a trap. Seeing what I saw, again, the body wasn't bloody, mangled, or in any way appeared damaged. And I really doubt any car can hit something that large and not be crashed or damaged itself. Even if a semi-truck had hit that thing, there would be blood and there would be damage. So I don't know. Anyway, thank you for listening. Every Halloween, the high school seniors would have this legendary party out in the woods where all sorts of urban legends had been born. There was talk of a witch in there that one year back in the 70s, one of the cheerleaders went mad with jealousy after fighting her quarterback boyfriend making out with her co-captain and stabbed them both to death. That there were little ghosts of children who had died of smallpox when settlers came to America. You name it. There was a story for it involving those woods. Vampires, werewolves, even zombies had been seen there over the years, supposedly. Of course, our generation thought it was amazing as we love a bit of creepy stories as much as the next people. But, not surprising, we didn't really believe any of it. So, when it was our turn for the party, the only thing on our minds was making sure someone could bring booze and who was hooking up with who. It was nearly a rite of passage, something to brag about to the underclassmen and the highlight of the year. There would be more posing for selfies and uploading them to Insta than ghost stories. But that's what we do. There were some amazing costumes and beer. 
very cheap liquor, and even pot. I'd never been tagged in this many photos. People were even live streaming it, and it was just a blast. Then, the guy I had liked since our sophomore year asked if I wanted to go into the woods with him. I knew instantly what that meant, so you bet I was on it. Now, since your listeners aren't here for the romance, or some kind of cheap thrill, I'll skip all that. But let me tell you, before anything could get R-rated, we heard a noise. It basically sounded like heavy breathing to start. Real fast, heavy, raspy breathing. So, since we're at a teen party, in the middle of the woods, with people hooking up left and right and center, I was not remotely scared. A little pissed, as this makeout session was a long time coming, and I did not want some peeping Tom to ruin it. I yelled out and called out to them. Then, we heard it again. Heaving, fast breathing. Then I realized it wasn't fast breathing. It was like a panting. But really low in pitch. Think of like a big dog. A really big dog. On a hot day. Except it was more raspy. Still not afraid. I began to think somebody wasn't only watching. They were trying to get in on this. The heavy panting then stopped and was replaced by a low, rumbling growl. The closest it sounded to was a lion. Definitely not a human. What the hell, I thought. The branches on one of the trees just behind us began rustling, and then I realized we really messed up this time. The noise and the movement seemed to be coming up in the tree, like up in the branches. I thought to myself that animals or dogs can't really climb trees, not like that. So I grabbed this guy's hand, and we ran out of there before we could discover exactly what was in that tree, growling. But I did turn around, and did get a look. Although I didn't exactly see it in full, I saw a shape. I remember seeing something that looked kind of like a dog, with large red eyes. It didn't follow us out, thank God. And when we raced out and told everybody, they thought it was a brilliant spooky story or it was some elaborate prank. A few of the footballers even went back in and shone their iPhone lights at the tree, knocking the branches. But whatever had been there was now gone. I have no idea what it could have been, and I know we heard it, and I cannot dismiss what I turned and saw. It was horrifying looking, even though I only saw its shape, or the general shape, and I saw a dog-like head. Creepy. Last winter, 2019, my family and I decided that we needed a good time out from the hectic lifestyle that we all lead. So, my wife, me, and our two teenage boys headed up to the cabin in the woods that a close friend of ours owned. Only this far surpassed any notions of a backwards hillbilly shack in the wilderness. This was like a beautiful mountain oasis. It was a beautiful and sturdy wooden lodge in the snowy mountains, perfect for chilling out in front of the fire with a good book and ski fun in the day. And of course, our friend gave us the usual wildlife warnings. Although there hadn't been a sighting for years, like bears, they were still in the area and very active to be exact. We weren't terribly concerned, just mindful and respectful. But again, it was so cold up there. Any sensible creature would be hibernating, or at the very least, had found some cave to bunker down in. Now, we didn't tend to wander too far, having brought a ton of supplies with us and packed well, since there wasn't any local supply store for miles. That was the charm of all of it. The boys were happy to have a break from studying even if that also meant no video games, internet, phone time, etc. 
The sight of them playing Clue with their mom one evening had me brought to tears and had me excited more than ever that we finally get to have some fun family time. I think the fresh air wore everybody out too, as did the exercise. One morning, I wanted to take the sled down the slope at the rear of the property. It led towards some huge pine trees and kind of reminded me of Christmas. Looked like I was the only one up for it though. Both the boys were still snoring and my wife looked very perfectly comfortable and cozy with a mug of coffee and a good book in bed. I donned my snow gear and off I went. Now, I'm glad I was alone as they didn't have to witness what I did. But at the same time, I wish somebody else had been there to corroborate it. You see, that old sled, plus that steep slope, had me flying down into the forest way quicker than I'd planned, and I shot further into the woodland than I'd ever expected. When everything around you is pristine powder white, there are two colors you need to be wary of. We all know to never eat yellow snow, but have you ever seen red or pink snow? I hope you haven't, because it means one thing basically, blood. And depending on how much snow and red, lots and lots of blood. I will admit that I was frightened at that point. Not because I thought of anything weird happened. More than one of those bears was closer to us than I would have liked. And it had killed something like a rabbit. Or maybe a wolf. What other predators live up here in the mountains? Or, judging by the amount of red snow, many rabbits your mind will always try and find the most reasonable explanation. I picked myself up, preparing for the slow amble back up the slope. That's when I heard the noise. It should have been obvious by how fresh the blood trail looked that the predator would be close by. At least I thought it was just a bear, maybe a wolf, a coyote. I'm not exactly sure what lives up here, but now, I could hear the sickening noise of biting and tearing as what I thought was a bear ripping into an animal. It was coming from just behind the trees where the branches were so low and dense. It was like darkness. Having never been face to face with a bear before, I wasn't certain what type of noise they make or why this one wasn't hibernating, but thought it was something akin to a snuffle or like a shriek when they're angry. The noise echoing through the trees was more like heavy panting and a low, winding growl. I quickly wondered if I had read anywhere about wolves. That's when it made a roar, like a dog. And I should know, our neighbor has two German shepherds, and they can be very noisy when they get riled up. Had a wild dog done this, Grabbing the sledge and holding it in front of me as a makeshift weapon or shield, I have no idea. I crept as quietly as I could through the snow, which was when it peered around the tree to look right at me. Now, I'm a big guy. Before I headed up the corporate ladder, I considered playing football as a linebacker, actually. I'm tall, rather heavy set, and this thing, whatever it was, was looking down at me. At first, seeing as we were in the mountains, I thought it was a Yeti. But on closer inspection, it looked more like some sort of ape or humanoid, but had the head of a dog or a wolf. It didn't come near me, but stared at me with the most intensity that bore into mine. Whether it appeared aggressive to me or not, I don't know, because I turned and fled. I climbed back up the slope as fast as my arms and legs would allow me to. When I told my family, my boys were scared, and my wife immediately began to pack things up. They know I'm not a storyteller, and I have no reason to make things up like this. I think I was so pale and genuinely terrified, it really shook all of them. We headed out of there 
without looking back once. I even asked my buddy if he had ever seen anything strange out there, but he hasn't and doesn't have any weird stories, only that he sometimes hears howls here and again, but that could be attributed to the many and vast wildlife out there. What I saw, I have no idea. This thing was kind of a smoky gray, maybe a light charcoal color, and was covered in thick hair, and again had the head of a wolf or a dog, with very intense yellow eyes. I can't think of an animal that it could have possibly been, because it was far too large to have been a bear, and bears don't have a head like that, nor do bears stand up on two legs that perfectly. What it was, I'll never know. My friends and family have been calling me the Dog Whisperer ever since I was 12. I have been able to gain the respect, if not the trust, of just about any canine animal, and it has made me somewhat of a local celebrity. Well, maybe I'm just brushing my shoulders too much, at least a celebrity in my family. I can even approach wild wolves without worry. Okay. Maybe not that far, but I feel confident if I were given the opportunity. While I can't exactly give a dog a hug, I'm somehow able to occupy their space and they don't bother me. This has even happened with more aggressive dogs. The ultimate test of this talent or gift, or whatever you want to call it, came when I was visiting for a dog show in Michigan back in 2017. Apparently, Michigan is home to its own monster, known as the Dogman, and it is sighted in regular intervals of years ending in seven. Google it. It's an actual thing. Like anybody that appreciates dogs, I have also have a love for the outdoors and traveling so far away from home that it's given me the chance to see some beautiful fall scenery that I otherwise would have never had the chance to see. I was already near the Great Lakes area, so I decided to check out what the water and the landscape looked like at that same time of year. It was breathtaking, despite how much fog was rolling in off of the water. I saw the shapes of boats and barges as silhouettes, and I heard the sloshing of fish striking at frogs and other things. But then I heard an exceptionally loud splash that sounded like somebody could be in trouble. I was standing where the water met a bank that turned into a tree line, and visibility was probably no more than four or five meters. The splash had made me think that perhaps somebody had fallen into the water I paused to listen for sounds of struggling, but there were none. Would an otter make a splash that loud? As I drew near the general direction of the sound, another silhouette emerged that filled me with an exhilarating cocktail of both amazement and fear. The gray outline developed into a large towering shape of mangy black fur, slick with moisture, rippling with strength and muscles. The blackness of the thing was offset by two sharp eyes that gave their own light, just like two yellow torches. They were trained on me with laser-like precision and focus. I didn't know what to call the thing at the time. Werewolf was what came to my mind, except werewolves don't exist. I only found out about the local legend of Dogman later on, not during this sighting. Needless to say, that means I obviously survived the encounter, but it didn't go quite the way I would have liked. I wrestled with my fear and choked it down, allowing it just enough room for my ego and my confidence to fill up the empty space. So, I, the Dog Whisperer, would not back down from this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to elevate my career above all other reputed dog whispers. I can't believe I did this looking back, 
but I was fairly confident that I would be successful. This monster stood and regarded me as if puzzled over my not fleeting away in terror. It had long ears just like you would see on a lynx. They twitched and dialed at all the sounds in the vicinity. I was taken by the brutish majesty of this animal. While it looked absolutely terrifying, I had to understand and respect that it was still an animal. I boldly stepped forward and tried to tune in to that innate gift of mine so I could ply the monster with it. I even employed the wines of an Omega Wolf that I had learned to make. This struck its curiosity. It now tilted its head directly at me. I took this as a sign of progress and my heart pounded as I was instantly in fight or flight. It was then that I was close enough that I could put my hand on its shoulder and then I began to think I was making a huge mistake. Its breath was in my face, pumped between teeth as long and as sharp as steak knives. With the width of the head and the length of the snout, I imagined that it could have fit my entire head in its mouth if it truly wanted to. If you've ever seen the movie Dog Soldiers, I think it came out in the early 2000s. It was kind of like that, just a massive humanoid wolf animal. The smell of its breath was that of rotten meat. It was terrible. But there was something else that got my attention and triggered a much more deeper primal fear. The animal had the undeniable scent of brimstone on its breath. Yes, brimstone, as in sulfur. Something like satisfaction flickered in the creature's eyes when I felt the fear twisting in my stomach. Somehow, I knew it could smell it. Maybe it even knew what I was thinking. The word werewolf had begun sounding more like hellhound in my mind. As if on cue, the monster swiped at me with one paw. The blow laid me out, completely catching me by surprise. It was a swipe not to kill me. It was like it was toying with me playing with a mouse before a cat would eat it. It stood over me, and I held my arms over me in defense, as if that was to stop this killing machine. Any thought of my way with dogs blasted out of my mind with fear. I waited for the moment that it would rip me open like a deer carcass. It didn't. Other voices rang out. Someone saw the other shape strike me down, and words had drifted into my ear about calling the cops. This thing grunted at the choice before it bounded off, quickly in the speed of light, giving me a long look as it turned away. I went through with the dog show, though I probably should have excused myself. As thrilled as I had been, there was something about that encounter that struck a nerve deeper than any natural fear of predators. The smell of brimstone the unnatural glow to its eyes. That wasn't just any rare species of canine. It was truly a dogman, a creature from some forbidden realm of unspeakable evil. No feral creature can reach so far into the inner sanctum where the soul is seated. And that's exactly what that monster did to me. Look, I know my story sounds incredibly far-fetched and even crazy, but I have to be honest and I have to tell you exactly what happened to me. So, that's my story, and you could choose not to believe it. But I will say one thing is for sure. This whole experience has certainly turned me from an atheist to a believer, because there's no denying that that thing was not of this world. When I'm not at the office during the daytime, I bow hunt as much as I can I own more than enough acreage in southern Illinois to give me an adventure every time I want the thrill of sniping several weeks worth of food. Yes, I eat everything I kill. It's only right. It's how you show respect for the land and the animals that you hunt. I love the way that Native Americans view it. You kill something, you eat it, and you utilize everything of the animal. 
even the bones, the fat, everything. I don't do trophies, unless it's my first kill of a certain species. And even then, I still eat everything I can. I had a shot at a trophy that nearly made a meal out of me one summer evening. It was close to nightfall, but not quite. A bizarre in-between stage where the evening made the whites of the birch trees a lavender color and the sky was an amazing peach and crimson. I could have stared at the sky instead of keeping up the hunt, but I was due for landing some food. There had been some heavy rains in the morning and I found myself sloshing through the prairie grass when a white-tailed buck came over a low hill and struck a million-dollar pose in the sunlight. If I had a camera ready, that would have made me enough money to buy me my own island. Well, not really. But I did not have my own camera. I had a bow, and I needed food. I was careful where I was placing my feet to cut down on the sloshing. I pulled back my arrow and aimed. Like a crack of thunder, the buck's antlers shatter like pencils as something came down on it with the force of a sledgehammer. The thing was far too black for the dimming sunlight to pick it out. It was plenty big enough to be a bear, but it certainly was not built like one. Bears didn't look like weightlifters with chiseled muscles. I think even bears looked cleaner and more well kept than this thing did. Even as a shadow, the grungy filth of this creature was apparent. Some of the fur was matted and looked almost like dreadlocks. The eyes though, those eyes glinted like golden ore in a dark mine shaft. They burned with the light of a predator. The thing twisted the deer's head in a clean 180 degree turn and then tossed the entire body around like a rag doll. When its fury had subsided, I could make out dog or wolf-like features. Just everything was much bigger. The beast radiated strength the way lava gave off heat. I don't think I was going to get that food that I was thinking about. But I was determined to get me a trophy. This demon wolf, whatever this horrific creature was, I was going to make it mine. Now... I don't know if you consider me brave or stupid, but regardless, if you've ever seen how a modern bow and arrow works with skin and bone, if you've got the right setup, it'll go in one side of your target and out the other like a bullet. I had this thing dead in my sights, and I was going to carve its heart out if I landed the shot the way I had intended. Part of the thrill of the bow is the way the arrow seems to fly in motion from your end of things. I watched that arrow go straight for the chest. It reared back and howled so fierce that I could feel my teeth rattling. But the arrow didn't go through the beast. It barely even penetrated. The monster yanked the arrow from its chest, leaving a very superficial wound. I knew better than that. I readied another arrow. Deer will attack if your shot doesn't kill them or run. I was sure what was true for this was especially true for a monster of this size. Hopefully, I hadn't just doomed myself, but I was stupid and determined, and I was right. It locked eyes right on me and charged at me like a bull, clearing distance to me very fast. I let my next shot go, and one of those two glowing eyes was now gone. The red barrel of my arrow bloomed from the thing's eye socket, and it fell to the ground. It ruined the moment by getting back up, and it staggered as if drunk. It acted as if I just had smacked it. It was hardly even phased. It appeared to make the decision to run. I tried to handle it like a deer, following the blood trail. Only with this thing, there was no trail, which didn't make any sense unless it just didn't bleed. That was the last time that I ever saw anything like that. My heart skips a beat whenever I see an ordinary wolf or coyote 
and I wait to see if it's going to stand up on its hind legs. Of course, they never do. That's my story of that one that got away. Only, I swear to you, it's true. And I know it sounds insane to have a huge wolf like that be walking around on two legs like a grown man. But I was determined enough and stupid enough to try and take it down. Only, I failed. And who knows the wrath that I'll probably bring upon myself by endangering it. I served in the military police in Iraq back in 2004. Every hour of every day was a game of Russian roulette. Improvised explosive devices would take out supply trucks that would try to escort over very dangerous roads, and there's no way of knowing where the explosives were except to just drive and hope that nobody's tires were on the wrong place at the wrong time. IEDs, they call them. Each time that I dodged death, it was the equivalent of making the right call of a coin toss. So, needless to say, I was in a perpetually heightened state, running on what I would call Red Bull and pulling 18-hour shifts. When your senses are constantly in overdrive, that much for that long, you don't always know if you can trust them. That's how your nerves get overdrawn and you're ripe for developing PTSD. I came back to the States with acute PTSD symptoms. But you know what? It wasn't because bullets were flying over my head. Although that was a large part of the experience. See, Iraq is like one big acid trip. There are ancient ruins in some shape or form everywhere and the locals treat them like they're no big deal. Stuff that was built closer to the time that Jesus walked the earth is irrelevant, spray painted with stuff, all sorts of stuff, and 100 dialects that you find over there. It was one such cluster of ruins, an ancient city that lost its place on the map, where bandits and ruffians alike set up camp and decided that me and my convoy were now target practice. I manned the gunner's nest on top of the APC that I was in. I put my life in the hands of the other man that I left at the steering wheel. This batch of men weren't backing down from the cannon I used to carve slices out of the ancient ruins they were hiding behind. A few of them, I think under the influence of something, came out into the open. Well, you don't just turn down an invitation like that. I was going to blast them down when three or four towering shapes raced out of the ruins and mauled them to death. My eyes were telling me that I was looking at walking rabid dogs. My brain was telling me that this was impossible, but it wasn't my hallucinations that were butchering those bandits before my very eyes. They didn't stop to eat. They began leaping towards my convoy like large furious dogs and they struck me with terror that made my hand shake so much I almost couldn't aim or fire the APC's cannon. If you know anything about the stuff that goes on in Iraq, you might have heard giants being discovered in the Iraqi mountains. Yes, I'm talking little giants talked about in the days of Noah and biblical stuff that's well covered up. So, I had heard stories of that from fellow soldiers here and there, but only took it with a grain of salt. I guess this area is keen, and when I say area, I mean all the Middle East, Iraq especially, for its paranormal and weird stuff that goes on. So I guess I shouldn't be too surprised in hindsight, but these oversized dog creatures were just kind of shrugging the bullets off. Two of them succumbed to their injuries dark and inky blood splattering. The rest of when I saw, I realized that I could actually kill them, but they scattered. I took the whole thing as a sign that I was well overdue for rest. My turn to sleep finally came, but my problems did not end there. Strange howls and weird noises filled the night when we were moving or holding still. My men weren't sure what to make, 
since they sounded like they were coming from wolves that were immensely sized. I didn't say a thing. Deep down, I had a hunch that we were being hunted. The ones that survived were not only real, but I'm sure they wanted revenge. I didn't know how I knew this. It was just an innate feeling, like the moments when my deepest intuitions had been right. I just knew, a feeling that I was a marked man. I mean, I knew that terrorists and their sympathizers were going to lash out, but they didn't have the keen senses that allow them to zero in on their quarry like these beasts do, these rabid humanoid wild dogs. Several nights passed where those otherworldly howls and growls were somewhere far away, but not too far, close enough to come calling if I ever fall asleep long enough. That awareness has wrecked me, and I was discharged not long after for being deemed mentally unfit to continue my service. This has happened to many servicemen that never gets talked about. The howling even followed me home to Maine. How the things have tracked me across the ocean, I'll never know. Or maybe it's the sound haunting me. Maybe they aren't really flesh and blood, or only partly so. I don't know. Guns and barricades and iron bars are never far away enough anymore. It's the only way I could steal a few hours of sleep after spending hours of hearing my own heartbeat. It's probably going to give out before any of these demons come looking to make their killing blow. Thank you for listening to my story. Some horrendous monster that looked like a cross between a bear and a wolf and came from hell came at me when I was walking alone in my favorite forest. It was really rugged, so I often found myself alone. This monster from a dream, a horrid fairy tale, locked onto me, and I couldn't shake him for anything. It had clearly demonstrated that it was far faster than I, and it even got ahead of me a few times. It was cunning. I don't know why it didn't go in for the kill. It was like it was toying with me wanting me to be the most exhausted and scared and more afraid than putting me out of my misery. It had ample opportunities to take me out, but it never did. And dashing across creeks and rivers didn't shake it off my scent. So I got desperate and headed towards the nearby lake. Conveniently, there was a small fishing boat with three people. I called out to them, begging for help, but I must have looked too wild and geeked out and on adrenaline for them to trust me, because they kind of just stared at me, waiting for me to make the next move. Desperate, I scrambled up a tree in full view of the boat. This creature was on my heels by seconds, and, just as I had feared, was every bit capable of climbing. Part of my brain screamed at me just to give in and let it have me. The other part of me, the part that I listened to, told me to climb as high as I possibly could, although pointless it probably was. I reached that point where if I went any further, the tree would bend and drop me. This wasn't a terribly large tree, so don't think I was trying to climb up some 100 plus foot tall oak tree. I reached the point where if I went any further, the tree would bend. I had put distance between me and my assailant because it was clumsy, but it couldn't be delayed forever. I yelled again to the boat, which had drawn away some distance. I think that's when I was truly convinced that I was going to die, when I could see my last chance for hope of somebody listening, leaving. Like a terrible action movie, this thing's head suddenly bloomed a hole like something small inside of it had exploded. I looked back out to the boat and saw that one of the men had a large rifle and was aiming at me, or rather this creature that I was being attacked. That's when I quietly thanked God and thanked whoever was on that boat. 
That's also when my survival mechanisms started to fold up, with the knowledge that help was now in my way. My grip was loosening on place and the tree, and I suddenly had the urge to fall asleep. Two more shots, one in the head and one in the ribs, puffed out its fur of my attacker until it fell out of the tree and landed on its back. Rather than breaking its neck like it should have, the thing just got up, as if totally unfazed, like the three bullets did nothing and casually ran away to the woods. It blew my mind. My saviors in the boat had gotten close enough to make sure I was still alive, but they didn't extend any hope beyond that, and I questioned who the real monster was that day. They kept asking me, where on earth do wolves that size come from? That thing was huge. I found my way back to my vehicle and locked the doors. I blocked out after that. But even then, to this day, I've had no incidents. I figured backstory to this didn't really make sense, and so I would just jump in with my encounter. I greatly appreciate your show and you getting people's experiences out there, no matter how real or phony they sound. I think it's important because it allows people like us who would feel otherwise ridiculed can step forward and share our story with the world. Whether people choose to believe it or not, that's on them. Sure, not all of us are the best storytellers and I can understand how someone who's not good at telling a story could make a particular experience come off as phony, but I try my best to relay what happened to me and I hope this helps anybody who listens to it, if you choose to read this. Hi, What Lurks Beneath. My name is Sam, and I have some pretty intense things to tell you about, things that I've been seeing recently. To bring you up to speed, ever since COVID has hit, I've since lost my job of six years. So, that's given me a lot of downtime to be home, and, Fortunate for me, I've been able to acquire a databasing job online, so now I can work from home. But now, this all leads up to the story that I want to tell you. I live kind of out in the middle of nowhere, as I'm sure many people who write to you do. My outer environment isn't as cliche as many would like to believe. No, I'm not surrounded by thick forests or woods, or anything like that. Surrounding me, is actually a lot of dead zone, old agricultural farmland that is not being used currently. I'm not exactly sure if it's not owned or whoever does own it is just neglecting it. Either way, directly behind my house that I'm currently renting is a very, very large field that's currently not being used at all. I'm pretty sure at some point or another, the large field behind my house was directly used for harvesting hay since the large tire tracks of tractor marks. On the sides of my house is pretty desolate as well, just large empty fields with a few trees here and there, but pretty much no coverage. And directly in front of my house is maybe 50 feet of grass and a tiny road that takes you around the area. There's not really any neighbors out here either, so it's pretty much just me. Luckily for me though, I got pretty good internet and I got the house for a good deal. It's an older place for sure, but it does provide plenty of shelter and protection. Anyway, now that I've given you enough backstory so you kind of understand where my situation is, here is where my story begins. So, going back to what I said, I lost my job at the beginning of April, and since then, have been home pretty much the entire last six months. Yikes, right? Well, that's what you get for living out in the middle of nowhere no friends really want to visit you. So, I've spent a lot of my time taking up new hobbies and acquiring that new databasing job. The reason all of this is relevant is because since I'm home, I've been able to see things that I never noticed before. I've been living at this location for around three and a half years now, and my old job kept me so busy and out of the house. I don't think I ever would have noticed this happening had I continued that job and not lost it. But, since being home so frequently, I now notice this phenomenon, as I like to call it. 
What exactly am I talking about? Well, I know this sounds crazy. At least, I thought I was crazy. Until I decided to dig around online. More specifically, YouTube. And found out that there are tons upon tons of people with very similar sightings and experiences, just like I. What I'm talking about are large, upright walking wolves. And not just one, or two, or even three. I'm talking about an entire pack, like eight or nine of them. However many is traditionally in a pack of wolves. I don't know. I'll see them sometimes in the evening and early morning hours, roaming in a tight militant unit, walking from one end of the field, far off to the other, past the distance of my visibility. They don't seem to show any interest in my house or coming near me. They're far from the field, but these animals, beings, whatever you call them, are so large, they really do stick out like a sore thumb. Lucky for them, besides me, there's really nobody else out here to see them. No wandering visitors just passing by. And the road in front of my house, even though it is a public highway, technically, it's pretty dead. There might be five or six cars that drive through it the entire day, which is saying a lot. And that's what I consider a busy day. I guess I should probably be more frightened by this incident, but after seeing it several times for the last few months, I haven't really grown weary or terrified of these things. More curious at this strange phenomenon. I'm not exactly sure what they are, or if they're human or part human or animal, because to my knowledge of the animal kingdom, there's no canid animal that walks upright just like a man does, and walks in a pack. Unfortunately, because they're so far away, I can't really give you specifics on what they look like, just like the color of fur or any other specific details that they might have. But I can definitely tell these are somewhat canid creatures that are clearly bipedal. That's enough for me. At first, I kind of chalked up the idea of werewolves, but quickly dismissed the notion because, well, one, that's silly, and two, werewolves don't exist. If these are some sort of unknown animal, I think there's a good reason to explain their existence and why they're there. They always seem to be traveling from the same point A to the same point B. Point A being when you step out my back door, all the way to the very back of the field, to the far right. They seem to be coming from that direction. Then, they head all the way to point B, which is to my far left at the other end of the field. Why they never come close to the house or seem to show any interest is beyond me. At first, I didn't think that, but after listening to several stories and encounters, I painted a different picture of these things, that they were bloodthirsty and wanted to instill fear in their victims. I mean, I don't try and hide my presence living in this house. I'm not overly loud or obnoxious, but I don't hide the fact that I live here, so I'm sure they must know. I don't see them every day, or every morning or every night, but I do consider I see them often, maybe a few times a week, and it's always either the early morning hours or the evening time, maybe like 6pm, 7pm, just as dusk is starting to really set. Part of me wonders if these predatory animals are patrolling the perimeter of an area that they claim is theirs. I have never tried to walk to the back end of the field. Sure, I've stepped foot on the field itself, just to check it out when I first moved in, which is why I told you about the tire marks and the tractor marks, which leads me to believe that this field was once used for hay harvesting. But, since no one currently owns it or is in use, it's pretty much just a dead field of grass and dirt. Which leads me to assume that these creatures are probably coming from far off in the distance, where there is woods. But when I say far off in the distance, I mean probably a couple miles off in the distance. Like I said before, surrounding me is just empty fields, with few trees here and there. And when I say few trees, I'm literally speaking a few trees. One tree here, one tree there. Very sparsely spread out and pretty much provides zero coverage of shadows or anything to hide behind. So, 
I'm not exactly sure where these things are coming from, or where they're coming to. And if they are what they claim to be, judging by stories and encounters from your YouTube alone, then why would they want to reveal themselves like this? Why would they put themselves in a spot of vulnerability where others can see them? I mean, I don't think they knew that nobody else is out here. I would love to know your thoughts on the matter and what exactly you think they're doing because I'm pretty sure without a doubt that the only thing that can make up what this is is a dog man. But why would they be out here in the middle of nowhere revealing themselves and being completely vulnerable with nowhere to hide or anywhere to cover. Part of me speculates that if I go beyond further of the field, there might be underground tunnels, but I have absolutely zero proof of any of that, and it's just a wild guess. About 10 or so years ago, I was driving back from visiting my parents. My then three-year-old son was fast asleep in the back, so, when I couldn't hold the need to use a bathroom any longer, I decided to pull off the highway at the first rest stop I could find. I knew I should have gone to the bathroom of my parents, but you know how it is when you're trying to get out of there and you don't want one thing to hold you back. I decided I would try and wait till I got home, but clearly that did not work out for me. And despite looking like something you'd find in a serial killer movie, needs must and I rushed over to the ladies room leaving my son asleep in the car. There was no one else around, and I would be quick. It seemed the less painful option, rather than waking him up and dragging him kicking and screaming into the dirty bathroom with me. I was super fast, and hurried back to the car, where I found my kid awake and staring out the window intently. He didn't seem too upset to have woken up in a strange place, and no mama in sight. So, I counted my blessings, and I rolled with it. We were quickly back on the highway. Thank the Lord. He was still looking pretty out of it. You know, the way preschoolers have about them when they first wake up. Kind of like they don't know where they're at. And was nursing on a juice box. So it took a little while before he spoke. I remember he asked me a question. And I answered back to him, looking in my rearview mirror right at him. He just tells me he saw a really big doggy. I asked him, a big dog, huh? I asked almost absentmindedly, not really questioning it as a kid, because kids always remember things they saw a month ago with no context. And a three-year-old being a three-year-old could have easily saw a dog that he would have considered big. But this was late at night with nobody else around. In hindsight, there was nobody, or should have been nobody, walking their Great Dane or large dog around. I mean it happens, but probably not. My son went on to tell me that this dog was real big, just like Daddy. And I remember I asked him, like Daddy? It almost made me chuckle. My husband is 6'2", so I guess he would be considered really tall. My son just kept saying, yes, Mama. Real tall, just like daddy. Hmm, that's what I told him. We carried on driving for a while, not really thinking too much. That's until I saw a sign for a roadside diner and thought it might be a good idea to stop for an early dinner. Pulling into the parking lot, we drove into a space and I got out and stretched my legs. Unbuckling my son, I lifted him into my arms and locked the door. Something on the roof of the car caught my eye. A dent, and what looked like several scratches which had not been where we left for our trip. I cursed, immediately getting angry. What on earth could have done that? Those markings weren't there when I left my parents. My son looked into my eyes, and a solemn look upon his face, and said, I told you, Mama. It was the big doggy. Have you ever experienced that emotion of total and utter dread? You know, where your skin is covered in goose flesh and you feel sick to your stomach. Like the pit of your stomach just sucks in everything around it. It's like feeling death. What doggy? I asked. He told me the big one from the place she went potty. 
I looked back to the scratches on the roof. There was no way in hell any dog could have made those. I asked him, what do you mean a big doggy? I kept asking, wishing he would make sense. But I guess wishing for a three-year-old to make sense is like asking, like an utter miracle. My son looked at me, calmly said this, yeah, mama, the big doggy, tall like daddy, with a doggy face. When you went potty, he came over to the car to see me. He stood real close, and then he ran away. I think he heard you coming back. I'll never know for sure what my son saw that day. He's, of course, now a teenager and a total brat, but I love him, and he hasn't mentioned it for years. But I will never forget. In fact, I've even tried to talk to my son about it for a while, and he doesn't really remember. Obviously, being three years old, you can't really recount those kind of memories, unless they're usually very specific or traumatic. But anyway, I'll never know exactly what happened that night. Fast forward a few years when my son was seven or eight, we ended up getting rid of the car, so it's not like I have the evidence anymore. But I'll never know what exactly climbed on top of the car, and who knows if it was truly planning to wait and try and steal my son out of the vehicle. One of my best friends since college has Native American heritage, and let me tell you, some of the stories he had passed down from his grandparents literally beat any movie in terms of scare factor, hands down. In fact, several of them alone involved Wendigo and Skinwalkers, which are quite frankly terrifying. But for some reason, the tales that seemed to frighten me the most, the ones that left me with sleepless nights, were the stories about dogmen. See, although the stories about the Wendigo and Skinwalkers were amazing, they had, of course, supernatural and fantastical elements to them, which left you feeling like they were indeed just stories. Nightmare-inducing for sure, for stories nevertheless. But Dogman for some reason, it really just resonated with me. Now, my friend was very clear that these dog people were not to be confused with werewolves. Whilst the lore of the lichens meant those creatures changed due to the lunar cycle, Dogmen were Canaan humanoids all the time. It's just what they were. They were their own beings and were not humans that transform. That is what scared me, even more terrifying than the concept of a werewolf. But what also gave credence to his story was that there was one particular encounter that wasn't simply passed down while he sat on his granddad's knee. This was a story which was far more relevant and believable, simply because it actually happened to my friend himself. He didn't grow up on the res, but he would regularly visit and would often wander off exploring for hours, feeling totally safe and at ease there. One day, he was playing in the woods that sprawled out behind the houses when he found a couple of dead rabbits. No surprise in that since there were all sorts of predators out there, he needed to be mindful of them. I mean, after all, nature is pretty chaotic and random and if you're not prepared for it, it will not be merciful. But these rabbits hadn't been stunned or even killed for food, it seemed. They'd been ripped into pieces, like something picking them up and just pulling them apart, piece by piece. Think of a piece of paper, crumpled up, and then just ripped in pieces. That's the best way he could explain it to me so you can imagine that the visuals were less than pleasant to look at. He was more curious than afraid this time, wondering what would choose to do that. I mean, sure, plenty of things hunted for food. That just was the circle of life. But to play with it like that, that was far more destructive than essential for survival. Going further into the woods, for the first time in all of his years exploring, he felt a sense of disturbance, as if something was lurking in the trees, waiting, 
watching his every move. This is when he tells me that for the first time, he saw it. He specifically remembered that it was very tall, but yet also skinny and kind of frail, but not deathly frail. It was completely covered in dark fur, although it did look matted and mangy. It appeared to have patches of scabby skin showing through. The animal or creature he saw was clearly bipedal and stood on two bowed legs. It had a very clear and striking resemblance of a head of a dog, kind of like a German shepherd with a mix of Doberman. Not a wolf at all, and my buddy has always made this very clear. The head was no doubt a dog, and he can only guess that this creature he was looking at was indeed a dog man. Although he claimed to be absolutely petrified, he recalled feeling no intentional malice towards him. It felt in many ways that although this thing in front of him was the stuff of literal nightmares, it didn't show any interest at all in attacking him. But he remembers this feeling very vividly. There seemed to be an implied danger, as if were he to threaten the creature, then the creature would simply retaliate. And trust me, it wouldn't be pretty. So, he did what pretty much every single one of us would have done in that scenario. He turned and ran. Ran all the way back to his aunt's house and told everybody what he'd seen. And what did they do? Did they chuckle, ruffle his hair, and cite an overactive imagination? Did they grab their guns and head off into the woods, storming to kill the beast? No. They simply nodded and suggested that it might not be best to go back into the woods for quite some time. And you know what happened? He never went back because he truly believes in order to avoid these creatures, you need to stay out of their territory. It all comes down to respect, he believes. That even though these things don't necessarily respect us, but if we respect them, they seem to be much more honorable of staying away from us. Or so he believes. Since I personally don't believe in dogmen or have any experience with them, I can't agree or disagree. But since it's coming from him, which I hold as a very credible witness, I'll take his word for it. And if I ever see one of these things, I'll make sure to stay far away from any territory it might claim. A few years ago, I was staying with a buddy in his huge rambling farmhouse out in rural Texas. When I say rural Texas, I mean it. This place is out there. This place was massive and had a ton of land surrounding it. We were both writers, or should I say aspiring writers, and it was the perfect place for both of us to lock ourselves away and get on with the novels we were planning. There were plenty of deer on the property just wandering around aimlessly, and my buddy was pretty protective of them. A couple of times over the last week or so, we'd found one mauled to death at the edge of his land. Never pretty, and upset him a lot. I mean, this guy loved doe, especially doe, mainly because we never saw any big bucks around. It was just a large congregation of doe everywhere. He would constantly be setting on apples for them to eat, and any other salt licks he can find, sticking them around, hoping to draw them in. I think his plan was to pet one, and probably befriend one. When it happened for the third time, a deer being mutilated and found, despite it being what can happen often in nature, he decided to put down coyote traps, as he presumed that that was hurting his deer. Like I just explained, he became pretty obsessive and very possessive of these deer. Maybe it was coincidence, but there wasn't another attack for a few weeks, so he was sure that the traps drove away the coyotes. I mean, this was a good thing, as we had seen a few fawn, and then he was beginning to get really anxious that they would be easy pickings if the coyotes returned. After all, fawns are pretty defenseless. He even took to sleeping downstairs, a shotgun next to the door so he could rush out and help if needed. I thought he was crazy. 
But then it does get crazier. Because one night, we both heard an unmistakable howl outside. Even as a writer, although we both pen crime drama, nothing in the horror genre, I would struggle to put into words exactly what it sounded like. So the term howl is the best that I can come up with. I think it is the single most terrifying noise I have ever experienced. And I was in the delivery room with my wife when she gave birth to our twins, without painkillers. Needless to say, I bolted down the stairs to find my buddy and the gun gone. The front door side open. I threw on some boots, since you never walk outside in Texas without boots, and ran down to the traps. That was when I saw it for the first time. Despite standing with a gun aimed right at it, my buddy was frozen. I mean, I can't say I blame him. For there, in the trap, was what I can only describe as a wolf man. Now, I heard the audible gasp, the disbelief. Why on earth would I jump to that conclusion? Surely it was just a large coyote, or maybe a wolf. Well, let me ask you this. Did you ever see a coyote stand on two legs, just like a person, and walk upright? No? Did you ever see one that had a long skinny body and arms with hands resembling that of a raccoon's? Not paws and not human hands. I didn't think so. Have you ever seen one covered in hair so dark that it literally absorbed the light around it? I wasn't sure you did. And have you ever looked at its face and thought, that looks like a wild dog, but with human eyes? I bet you haven't. This thing was caught in the coyote trap. It was huge, taller than both me and my buddy, and we're both six feet ballpark. This thing was mad, viscerally angry, veins popping, mouth frothing as it pulled violently against the trap. Shoot, I stage whispered to my buddy, and he just seemed to snap out of his trance. He raised his gun and fired off a shot. Normally, he's a pretty good aim, but I think the fear overtook him so much, which led to unsteady hands, and the shot went wide. What it did achieve, however, was to fire up this thing even more. It gave another howl, although now being closer, it almost sounded like a human scream. Like the Incredible Hulk, it ripped itself out of the trap. We were now the ones screaming, and the gun was going off as my buddy was just shooting wildly at this thing, like he was playing Doom. I don't know how he could have missed every shot, but we'll never know, because this dog-man-creature-wolf thing ran off. It never came towards us, and seemed to be more pissed at being caught than wanting to hurt us or retaliate. The deer, of course, had all fled, due to all the commotion, and I'd felt like it took quite some time for them to feel brave enough, or safe enough, to come back and graze. We both stayed up all night those next few days, guns in hand, ready to shoot at the first sight of it coming again. Well, it never did. My buddy installs all sorts of expensive security equipment, cameras, etc. But nothing like that thing has ever been seen or heard on the property again. We will never know exactly what it was, and if it was hurt, or if there was more. But I will never forget seeing a human-like furry body with a dog's head and human eyes. It's by far the worst thing I have ever experienced, and I hope to God that I never see anything like it ever again. I'm writing in about an experience I had in the spring back in 2003. The date is stamped on my brain, just like the horrendous memories that I live with. I was a teacher at the time in Toronto, Canada. I taught children aged 8 to 9, primarily at a very small private school. Every year, we take the kids away on a field trip. And this time, we took them out of town to some nearby lakes where we could camp with two other classes. 
It was always such a fun experience for the kids. And of course, the adults enjoyed it too. I was never an outdoorsy girl or so, but my main role was just ensuring all of the children were content and had everything they needed. On our last day, which was a Sunday, some of the children were going kayaking, and myself and another teacher would catch up on some of our report cards. At the end of the academic year, we would give our report cards to the children and their families, which, of course, would inform them of their progress thus far. We both sat on the slopes beside the lake as we waved them off and watched them disappear in their canoes with their guides. It was a slight embankment, but it was dry and filled with all sorts of foliage. We both giggled and made each other sunflower bracelets. It was quite perfect and an amazing start to summer. However, just then, I got a knot in my stomach when I heard some rustling behind us. For the first time, I could actually feel danger and sense it without ever hearing it or seeing it. Something large, an animal of some sorts. I looked behind me, but didn't notice anything right away. The ominous feeling stayed lingering. Then, we tried to continue chatting, having girly time. This time, however, we were both cast and covered in a black shadow. I looked up and saw the most enormous and bizarre looking creature staring down at me with a ferocious, venomous look to its eyes. This creature had to have easily been nine or ten feet tall. I'm not joking you. It was a behemoth. The body kind of resembled a wolf, with pitch black, dark fur, giving it a seemingly very thick coat. You know how bears have a very thick coat of fur. It was like that, except black. But not black like a traditional black bear. It was darker, like it absorbed the light around it. I can't even begin to explain it. We both held each other, screaming in terror. This was clearly how we were both going to die. This thing, straight out of Halloween, was going to rip us apart. My eyes followed the beast's body, right up to its head, which I realized was that of a man and a wolf. It had human features, like the cheekbones and even the forehead bones, but it had a long muzzle with large teeth protruding out from its jaws, even though its mouth wasn't even open. Its head also appeared to be bald almost, but with long ears. Maybe it wasn't really bald, but more just parts of hair missing on its face and head. It was the most bizarre looking thing I'd ever seen. This thing's teeth were fang-like and long, seeping down below its jaws. They looked like they can cause some serious damage. These were clearly the teeth of a killer. I trembled with such a fear that I had never felt since I was a child. I was wrapped tightly in my friend's arms, ready for the jaws of death to claim both of us. When I looked up again, this thing was drooling, a bizarre thick kind of slime that almost had a texture to it. The beast continued to eye us with curiosity and aggression, clearly relishing our terror and fear. And its expression was like it was getting off on it, like it was enjoying inciting that much fear and terror into both of us. It's almost like it wasn't even wanting to move or make a move, because it kept wanting to scare us. For a second, I thought about rising from the ground and attempting to batter the beast myself, like my late father would have done. But who am I kidding? I just continued to sob on the ground, whimpering, hoping that it eventually would retreat, leave us alone, or kill us both quickly. It was the beast's eyes that were the most foulsome, red, with a hint of yellow. They probed us. They glowed. This thing had intelligence, and it seemed to stare into our souls and bodies. They were almost like little slits in the center. Not completely, but that's what it felt like. 
I've never had this feeling before, but I felt as if my body was literally breaking down from the sheer amount of terror and fear that I was experiencing coursing through my body. This beast again opened its mouth, exposing all of its horror of teeth, and roared at both my friend and I. Its whole expression and body perched over us in pure hostility. We just continued screaming, this time not stopping for what felt like several minutes. When we opened our eyes, I looked up to see that this creature had vanished. Even the drool that had came out of its mouth and dripped on the ground in front of me was also gone. There was no evidence that it had been there at all. It was the spookiest thing, and I kept expecting it to jump out and attack us. But it appeared the coast was clear. We were safe, or falsely safe. We both hugged each other before running back to the cabin. When the rest of the staff saw us, they knew something had happened. We told the principal who told us we both looked stressed and should take some time off work. We briefly sat down with them and explained what we saw. We were called in for psyche evaluations, but proved that nothing was wrong. Over the next few years, I received counseling regularly from skilled professionals who told me that the beast I saw was merely a metaphor for something going on in my life. Maybe something I didn't deal with in my childhood. But it was all bullshit. I knew what was going on. I tried to tell them. They wouldn't listen. And I know what I saw. This was terrifying. Big and brutal. It was awful. It has plagued my dreams for years. And has made me afraid to go anywhere near the woods. Sometimes when I drive at night, I look to the side and expect to see the same creature watching over me, or even chasing me. The worst thing about it is I don't know what it was. I have never seen anything as terrifying in all my life. I have searched countlessly online, through magazines, websites, expecting to see some kind of evidence that would hint towards this thing's existence, only to find nothing. I am not a frequent internet user, but recently, ventured onto the web when I spent some time googling my description of the beast, and I came across many forums in which other people talked about sightings of what they call a dog man. It seems the closest thing to what I saw, and the most plausible explanation. I have attempted art therapy to deal with the trauma of what I saw. In fact, just last year, Myself and the other teacher reconnected after many, many years and worked on a textile art piece in which we drew ourselves on the ground with a black figure above us. There is no doubt that this dogman broke me. Whatever it was has permanently changed my mental perspective. There are days that I'm just too fragile to go outdoors, but I try and I will. I hope that research on the internet will bring me to other people and groups and we can begin a collective healing for all those who have encountered these allegedly mystical beasts. I think the number one terrifying takeaway from everything I've told you is the fact that it had total and complete control over us in that moment for more than enough time to end our lives. But it didn't act out in violence. It didn't try to harm us. Instead, for whatever sick, twisted, sadistic reason, its intent and focus was on terrifying us and making us feel as much fear as possible. Why? I'll never know. But it was beyond traumatizing. And I believe that this thing fed off of every drop of fear we have. That it tried to pull that fear out of us. I'm not sure what it gained from it. But whatever it was, was feeding off of it. Where it went to. I don't know. I don't really believe in paranormal or ghosts, but it's very possible this thing has come from hell. When I was just a kid, my parents used to always tell me that there's all sorts of creatures outside that will eat you and kill you. But now I'm 19, and to be honest, 
a pretty friendless soul. The days are lonely, and the nights lonelier, even more so with COVID. It's a darn shame. I consider myself a good-looking girl and deserve more for my life. So, during quarantine, when the world is standing still, I've decided to go and venture outside. Granted, I live just outside of St. Paul, Minnesota, which I don't care what anybody says, is by far the most boring city in all the country. I mean, there's the mall, that's it. So in my neighborhood, which is on the north side of the city, this would have been around April, so the world was full of pooping bricks about the idea of COVID taking over. You know, back when everybody was hauling toilet paper and the shelves were bare and people were panicking. Well, life seemed boring and the town was quiet. So I decided to venture out for once. I was sick of the lonely Friday nights, endlessly scrolling on Instagram, watching everybody else have a good time. I deserve to have one too, I thought. My parents were working at the hospital, both in ICU, so it was just me at the time, home by myself. After going on a long walk in town, I eventually found myself right near a basketball court, neighboring a small park. This is at nighttime, and I love urban exploration at night. So I sat there by the bushes on a bench, and I got the most eerie feeling that I've ever had. It was like I was being watched. And suddenly, I expected a serial killer or some sort of rapist to pursue me, just like in video games or in movies. But a deep shiver permeated through my entire body, even more so than I could have ever imagined. So much so, that I actually twitched and jerked in my seat. I had a feeling to look behind me, and I did, resulting in me screaming. A large wolf was standing over me. I'm five foot two, and this thing was easily twice the size of me. I had to actually look up at it and wondered, had I been drugged? This couldn't be real. It looked like it came out of a horror movie. A huge monster with an orange glow to their eyes was peering down at me. The creature had matted fur all over its body. It appeared to be black or a smoky charcoal color. With the lighting, I couldn't exactly be sure. Its body was ripped, very athletic. Every muscle was pulsating underneath its thick fur. It was incredibly bizarre looking. Although in the moment, it seemed like a costume. I knew in the core of my body, this was a real living, breathing monster. My hands were sweating and my heart racing. I knew my only chance of survival was to run, but my legs stood stuck on the ground. My feet now bursting out of my heels as I fell backwards not noticing the pain at all, with my eyes locked on this creature. The creature's face was completely dog-like. It looked like somebody took a German Shepherd and glued it onto the body of this beast. It was terrible looking. The head itself was even larger than the body, disproportionately larger. As I squinted, I was able to take in the full horror of everything. I could see that it had fresh blood on its muzzle and just continued to stare into me. I closed my eyes and prepared myself for the savagery that would be the end of my life. With my eyes shut tightly, I began sobbing uncontrollably. After waiting for the end, maybe a few seconds, I opened my eyes back up and this thing continued staring at me, not moving. It was as if it was curious about me, like it was about to toy with me, like it was a hunter that came upon a dying buck. I had no idea what was about to happen, so I pulled my shoe off my foot and flung it at this creature before running away as fast as I could. When I got home, which I'm surprised I actually made it home, I spent the rest of the night in the hot shower trying to protect myself with a knife in one hand 
hoping that the hot water would mask any scent that I had on my body, in hopes that this thing wouldn't track me down. I vowed and cried in the shower to never pursue another night adventure ever again. And I never told my parents what happened. If they found out that I ventured, they wouldn't kill me, but I would surely know punishment. I don't know what it is that I encountered or why it didn't try and kill me. Why did it show curiosity in me? Why was it studying me as if I was some vulnerable prey that it was about to pounce on? I have turned my questions to Reddit, and although I haven't been able to find much, I'm convinced this was some sort of demon, some sort of monster. Even thinking about this, and talking about it, sends shivers down my spine. You know, honestly, I was really considering not even running this out and sending it in, because just going back to this memory is traumatic enough for me. Maybe I should send this out to as many people as I can to let them know there's something on the loose. But again, I don't want people to think I'm crazy, which is why I've shut down. People already think I'm weird, so I might just have to wait it out and see what happens. But I'm going to send this to you in hopes that my story can get out there. Thank you for listening and the time to read this. My grandpa had told me a story about dogmen. I just didn't know it at the time. I was seven years old when he began telling me about what it was like to live through World War II. See, he was drafted into the military, and there wasn't much that the war offered that he didn't get to see. He always had a way of looking around as if unsure he was being watched or whatnot. I guess it's the remnant of being in a horrific war. It wasn't unusual for him to spin around without warning, expecting to see somebody following him. I did not understand this behavior for a very long time. One day, he pulled me aside while I was helping him with a few things in the yard, and he took me into his workshop. He said, what do you think all these things have been for? He gestured to a few things that I had that I just accepted as being part of what war had done to him. He had several shotguns, one inside and outside of the house. He had one out in his workshop, and he had a pistol that he kept on him at all times. Yes, even while he slept, the man never let it get out of his sight. Not to mention the large combat knife that he always had strapped to his thigh. He sat me down and told me a story that I had heard many, many times before. That time he included all the details that he had left out, and it changed everything I thought I knew about him. The history books, according to him, weren't exactly telling the whole truth. It was indeed the Russians that gave the Nazis the push that they couldn't get back up from. But the Russians weren't the first to engage them for the last stand. The Nazis made it to their somewhat mythical national redoubt and time to dig in and prepare to push back against my grandfather and his company. The national redoubt tapped into a cave system that supposedly could sustain a determined army of Nazis for about five years. Pushing deeper into that cave system evidently caused some problems for the Nazis. This information my grandfather didn't come by until years and years later. All he knew was that when the call was made to move in on the last stronghold, the Nazis were already struggling with the creatures that looked like they came out of the darkest children's storybooks in the German countryside. Man-wolves, Grandpa called them. Towering, muscular, vicious beasts with their pointed ears drawn back in a primal range. They resembled that of the Anubis creature from Egypt, often depicted in hieroglyphics. They attacked like bees of an invaded hive. My grandfather remembered seeing one of the walking wolves swipe at a Nazi officer and scrape the clothing and the skin right off his chest, exposing his raw, bare ribcage and flesh. He was pretty sure 
that he spotted halters and brittles on some of them, as if the Nazis had tried to tame some of the monsters. Their attempts to dominate the depths of the natural world had clearly failed. The man-wolves had reduced the enemy to a corpse to be freshly picked clean. And then, they turned on my grandfather and his allies. Bullets didn't have as much stopping power with the creatures as they did the Nazis. If they had actually looked human, they could have been mistaken for super soldiers that the Nazis were trying to breed. My grandfather was a survivor, but even after making it back to America, he felt like the man-wolves were stalking him. He didn't know how they could do it, since it involved a trip across the ocean, but he was convinced that they had followed him. His argument was that the ocean has a bottom in the earth, and wherever there's earth, there's tunnels, no matter how deep you go. I have a very hard time digesting those logistics, let alone the notion of a bipedal humanoid wolf. But he lived his remaining years, armed and ready for them, if they ever stepped foot into his home. Grandfather has since passed. He died of natural causes. None of the cartridges he had ever stocked up on got fired into the heart of these dog creatures. But even I'll admit that I'm hesitant to ever sleep at his property, which he willed to me, just in case one of them really is out there and it decides to pick up my scent and follow me wherever I may go on this earth. Clearly, there are things more horrific than just your standard horrors of war that many people talk about. In fact, when many people talk about the term horrors of war, I think they're referring to the much darker side of things. Not just torture, violence, death and destruction, but the things that you don't hear about, just like these Anubis-like creatures. I think we've all seen the videos made by people that will play with their cats in a hallway. Each time the camera noses around the corner, the cat is a little bit closer. I had a similar experience with something that wasn't a cat. Quite the opposite. Well, it was a dog. It had beefed up muscles, rippling under its coarse black fur, and it walked on two legs. Uh, before I continue my story, I don't believe in werewolves. But if I did, this thing is how I would expect them to look. I was moving one of my friends out of a flat that was on the very edge of town. You could see the Welcome to Hollybrook sign from his window. The town, though small, had fallen under the shadow of gang violence. People were moving out as soon as they had the chance, and my friend was no exception. Despite living at the literal edge of town, my friend's flat wasn't very accessible. You had to find one specific frontage road, and that was the tricky part. I must have missed my turn since I found myself in a maze of clustered houses and mobile homes on a cold and cloudy day. I was running out of time, so decided to stop and ask for directions. I thought I had seen somebody on their porch in a narrow alleyway, so I parked and approached. I mean, it was broad daylight, minus the clouds, and it was still small town USA. How much did I really have to worry about, after all? Either I had been hallucinating, or that person just didn't want to talk to me, since they evaded me swiftly and wouldn't answer when I knocked on the door. When I turned to look at my car, I saw a shape at the far end of the alley, tall and dark, standing perfectly still. I called out to them, but got no answer. I descended the steps of the home and went to call out again, but I noticed that the figure was much closer. Just as if they had sprinted closer in the time that I took my eyes off of them. Then I blinked. They were even closer finally close enough for me to get a look at them in the gray daylight. I thought it had just been a tall man in a coat. There was no way this was human. The first thing I noticed besides the size 
was the creature's eyes. They gave off a glow that the diffuse sunlight couldn't dim. Every inch of its body was taut with physical strength. And that head. Dear God, did such things really walk this earth? Or crawl around inside of it? It looked every bit like a wolf. Except the head had to have easily been as big as a bear's head. I began trembling with a creeping, crippling fear that was due as much to the way the beast looked as much as the fact that the neighborhood was so claustrophobic. If I had to run, my escape routes would be few, and I would be turning around nothing but blind corners. This awareness caused panic to start snaking up my spine. The monster was a block away when I quickly dashed to my car. As soon as I was inside, long black claws were peeling ribbons of paint off my driver's side door. That instant of realizing that the thing was upon me is easily the worst feeling of my life. B-movies had taught me to more or less laugh at the word terror. That moment taught me to respect it, like some sort of powerful ancient deity. The beast howled in frustration when it could tell that I was beyond its grasp. I didn't make any phone calls or messages or anything. I simply got out of there, and I never went back. Why this creature that looked simply strong enough to rip the door off my car and pull me out? Why it didn't do that? I don't know. I guess I'll never know. I wish to remain completely anonymous. If I tell you my story, there is going to be somebody that will want to have me hunted down and killed. I prefer the term silenced, but you clearly get the picture that I'm painting. But the price of holding this story inside of me any longer would be much, much worse. I live east of your continent, where my comrades and I had been practicing drills in the wilderness with the aim of coming to America to incite terror while everybody is distracted by noisier events on the world stage. I can be forthright about this because all of my comrades are now dead. All of our training is carried out in confined conditions to sharpen our tactical senses. We favored a set of connected caves in a forest, which, from a teaching standpoint for military objectives, was perfect. The confined nature of the forest could be like the outdoor urban environment, while the caves could be like that of the inside of a building, interior environment. We always practiced with live ammunition. There is no substitute for the real thing, according to our teachers. We were also led into an unfamiliar branch of cavern to throw us off, and see how well we could adapt to the unknown. Nobody said a thing but I could tell that we all felt it at once, the sensation of being followed and being watched. A few of our comrades began to say that the enemy soldiers had discovered us, but no enemy I'd ever faced in combat made me feel like that, what with the hair on my neck standing up. The presence revealed itself in the light of our electric torches. A wolf demon straight out of the stories my guardians would tell me, just to keep me from getting out of bed at night. Perhaps the sight of the demon would not have had so much power over me if I had not been told those old stories, because I felt just like I was a small boy, all over again, trembling in fear at the final revelation of what I had always heard and dreaded seeing. Once I remembered, I was a grown man soldier. I raised my rifle and shot the monster, using too many bullets than I should have. I couldn't make my finger let go of the trigger. It was as much of a lifeline as a weapon in that second. I almost didn't think that I had hit this demon, but then it took a few steps forward and fell clearly on its face. I had killed a legend from my own childhood, but I was not a hero, nor did I feel like one. Someone shouted that there were more just like it coming into her light, and I felt like a frightened rabbit whose burrow had been breached. 
Those who held our lights were also locked in a fight, so visibility was unstable. I believe that I accidentally cut down one or two of my comrades on accident, as the demons were standing among us by then. I was aiming for their heads at first, but my terror became overwhelming, and I nearly shot at anything that moved. My rifle ran dry, and so I ran for all I was worth. Let me tell you, after that day, I did not see much of that worth in myself anymore. I made it out of the cave system, and only a handful of my comrades were outside. I saw none of our teachers. The next day, I took my belongings and the money I had made between serving under our teachers and the looting from successful campaigns. I left without telling anybody. I was certain that I would be hunted down. But I realized days later, who was left in our unit to even do the hunting? I have since ceased all interest in violence. I have gone off the radar completely with my life, as much as possible. I want nothing to do with any of this, or any kind of monsters. I understand that sending this to you, I am putting a target on me. I have read and listened to several dogman encounters over the years since I had my own personal experience, and the vast majority of them seem to have one common thread. They happen outdoors, and although admittedly terrifying, the creature ultimately runs away without usually ever causing any physical harm to said witness. And, whilst I am obviously thrilled that these people have managed to escape untouched, I feel the need to enlighten your listeners that not everybody is as lucky. And, one of those unlucky people is me. You see, a few years back, I had my very own encounter with a dogman. At the time, I didn't realize exactly what this creature was. Only instead of discovering a humanoid creature with a dog's head in the woods, at some distance, or a blurry nighttime sighting through a car window as you whiz past something unusual, this happened in my own home. I live in Texas. The house I have is pretty big. But, by my own admission, it really needs some work. And one day, I might get around to that. But, let's just say for now, there are a few rooms that look like they've been burglarized, even though nobody has been in there. I'm not proud, but I did inherit this place and all that crap that came with it, and, well, just haven't had the time or inclination to sort it out yet. This is relevant, I promise. Just keep on track with me. So... On the day in question, when I heard a crash from one of the rooms at the very back of the house, I was not instantly concerned. My mind did not go straight to an intruder, and definitely not to a monster. I'm a practical guy, if not much of a housekeeper. The first thing I thought was that maybe a pile of crap had fallen over. You see... I'd inherited this place from a great uncle, and to say he was a hoarder was a big understatement. I swear, he'd kept every darn newspaper that he had ever been delivered to him. So, to be honest, things were always toppling over, and at most, I thought it could have been some sort of critter, like a raccoon, maybe. Nothing I was particularly concerned over. If my potential housemate was of the furry variety, I would consider my options. But, as I said, I wasn't scared. So, I wandered through the place and checked in the various rooms to see if I could discover the source of noise or notice an avalanche of papers amongst the other carnage. That was when I heard another very distinct crash, followed by what sounded like snuffling or grunting from the room next door. 
I was still not remotely frightened at this point. It was more a case of what now? Opening the door to that room, though, I didn't see it to start with. As with most of the rooms, they were in such disarray. Piles of stuff covered up to the windows, too. So there was very little light, and being a very old house, the bare bulb on the ceiling was nearly useless. The first thing I noticed in this room was that it was very, very cold, which then led my attention to the window, which I could see now had been clearly broken. Now, I was starting to feel the suggestion of something being off, but I still wouldn't equate the feeling of fear not yet. More annoyance, I suppose, as now I would have to fix that window. I could just about make out where the stacks of books in this case had been knocked over and located the snuffling sound to the far corner of the room. At this stage, it was still a snuffly grunt. I do recall thinking it sounded like a boar and then dismissing it immediately as how the hell would a darn pig jump through a pane of glass? I began to creep over, really just intending to find out what critter I was dealing with and whether I could chase it out myself or needed to call for some sort of assistance. I wasn't scared of raccoons or anything like that, but you don't want one hanging off your arm as they do got sharp little teeth, especially if they feel threatened. I got around halfway across the room when it decided to show itself. It had been crouching behind the books, and now, as this thing reared up, it stood not only taller than the highest precarious pile of paperbacks, but almost reached my height. And I'm 6'2". Yeah, now I was starting to feel afraid. Real afraid because the first thing that sprang to my mind was that I was dealing with a human intruder in a mask. And humans can do damage as if they're brave enough to enter your house in daylight. And they're likely out of their minds on PCP or something. And, like all Texans, I have a gun, but it was upstairs in my bedside cabinet. I started to back away, as I'm not an idiot or a hero. When it crashed through the debris, it shoved me hard in my chest, knocking me to the floor. I could see now that this wasn't a human intruder. This was something much, much worse. Although it was tall and stood on its legs just like a person, that was as human as it got. The body, which was shredded and very muscular, was completely covered in dark, thick fur. It had long arms just like a person, but with huge hand-like paws instead of human hands. And at the end of the paws, as my bleeding chest could attest, were razor-sharp claws. And then was its head. Now, as I said, I had first assumed it was somebody in a mask a very realistic dog-like mask, but as it looked down on me, growling, I could clearly see this was not a costume. This hairy bipedal beast had a head like a Doberman pincher, resplendent with pointy ears, tiny little beady eyes, and a very overly large snout. Oh, and it appeared to be frothing furious, with a large tongue. I'm not too afraid to admit that I screamed. A full-on final girl scream, shriek, that any female would have been proud of. It answered this by arching its head back and howling this inhuman noise. The single most terrifying noise that I have ever in my life heard. Looking down at me, a mere helpless victim lying in wait on the floor for it to finish me, it swiped at me again with those same claws, and then off it went, crashing back through the broken window from whence it came. Somehow, I managed in my fear to crawl to my phone 
and called 911 before I lost consciousness. The doctors managed to patch up my chest, although I have some stellar scars. I did lose my arm, though. Its claws had all but severed it, and they were unable to sew it back in time. I told police exactly what happened. I even saw their faces as they made notes. They came and inspected the house, ran some quote-unquote tests, but I know they didn't believe me. They basically just concluded that it must have been a freak wild animal attack, possibly a coyote. Well, I'm here to tell you now, that wasn't no darn coyote, and I have the scars to prove it. It's taken me almost an hour to write this up, just using my left hand, since that coyote that crashed through my window ripped off my writing hand. I just hope this story helps you and your listeners be as vigilant as possible. These things don't just happen at night or in the woods. These dogmen are becoming braver, and they are now breaking into buildings, killing people, harming people. It's terrible, and they're not afraid of daylight either. Be very aware. Sometimes, as a police officer, you get to witness things that regular people couldn't even imagine in your wildest dreams, or nightmares. We often get hit with gagging orders and have to sign contracts to promise we won't tell. It goes on way more than you think, and it isn't just about sleazy politicians or screwed up celebrities. No. Sometimes this is full-on men in black stuff. I kid you not. I have seen many things that I will file under unexplained. However, there is one thing that I will break my code of silence for, as it was the weirdest and scariest thing I have ever seen yet. And people need to know about this stuff. Now, to try and keep my anonymity, I'm not going to disclose what city, or even what state this is in. Rest assured, I have it on good faith that this happens all over the US anyway. I was on an evening patrol when I got a call to attend a disturbance in the woods nearby, possibly a suicide. Now, no one likes this kind of call. Not only does it never get easy to find somebody like that, but even as a seasoned officer, I hate relaying death messages to family, especially when somebody has chosen to end their life. Apparently, a dog walker had been minding their own business when they noticed a pair of feet swinging from a tree. They couldn't make out much more as it was getting too dark, and I doubt they wanted to. Death by hanging ain't a nice way to go, so they did themselves a huge favor by not investigating further and dialing 911, just like a good Samaritan should. So, I prepared myself for the inevitable. The state of the body, the stench, as they always void their bowels at the end, headed over to the location, a standard issue leading the way. Sure enough, I soon came across the feet swinging from the tree, just as the witness had described. Only what they had admitted, or perhaps what their mind had not allowed them to process, was that the feet were hairy and had claws, and they belonged to an equally hairy body, which led right up to an equally hairy head, which in the light from my light looked like a dog. I was looking what can only be described as either a really tall dog with a human-like body and limbs, or a wolf man. Now, I realize that things can look distorted in the dark, and looking up at a body with its neck all stretched out can impede what you are actually seeing. And of course, it could have been a person in a Halloween costume, and a really good mask, right? Well. I have never seen anything as lifelike and detailed, if that was the case, but there was no way in hell I was touching the body right then. I called it in for the CSI, 
using our on-air code, for it might be something unusual. Within minutes, another unit arrived and began to cordon off the area. I was thanked for my time, reminded of the procedures and asked to leave, which I happily and promptly did, but not before seeing that body after they cut it down and put it in the bag. I'll never know what happened in the investigation, as I don't have that kind of clearance. I don't know whether the thing was killed, or what, or if somebody else caught it and then strung it up. All I do know is that this was in no way an elaborate costume or a prank. The head was near sheared off from the tightness of that rope, and the gore and meat exposed showed that thing was real. It was a dead werewolf, if I do say so myself. I don't believe in that stuff, but I cannot refute or deny what I saw in person. It was terrifying to say the least, and goes hands down as probably one of the scariest things I've ever encountered as an officer. This is a fairly short story, but true nonetheless. I don't have many details, as I sure as hell didn't hang around or even go back to verify what I'd seen. But essentially, here's the crux of it. A few weeks ago, I was driving home from college to spend a few days back home with my family. Although the drive was only a few hours, I had gotten caught up with a late meeting with one of the professors and was therefore running behind and at the time, it was already dark. Even though I'm almost 21, my mom still made me check in each hour to let her know I was okay and how much further I had to go. Around the halfway mark, I had come off the highway and traveled through some lesser used roads until I got back onto a main road, which would lead all the way into town that I lived in. I had driven this route many times and was not concerned. It was quite dark by now, but it was a clear night, so I could still see pretty good. My dad obsessed with me hitting like a moose or something. After all, we live in Maine. So, I was focused on being super vigilant as usual. I had my lights on. I was taking it steady, both hands on the wheel. And that's when I saw something I can't explain. Now, we all have sorts of beasties up here, as parts of the state are beautiful woodland and thick, rich forest. But it's unusual to encounter something if you are not off the beaten path. Even though this was a country road, I was by no means in the middle of the forest or out in the sticks, as many people like to say. So, my first thought as I approached it was that it was a dog, someone's pet even, that had ran away from one of the farms maybe. It was crouched at the side of the road, facing away from me. But as I drove closer, it turned in my direction and then did something I'll never forget. Stood up on two legs. This dog on the roadside stood up, just the same as a person would from a crouching position, and I was surprised by just how tall it was. I'm not going to lie, I was freaking out so bad, I put my foot on the gas and sped the hell out of there. I couldn't help myself from looking as I passed, and the only way I could describe it was that it was a really tall, upright, well, dog. It was furry, and definitely had a dog face. But even when my granddaddy's German Shepherd used to put its paws on granddaddy's shoulders, it was still very much a dog's body, especially the way it arched over. Dogs can't really stand up straight, you know how that is. Well, this looked like a hairy man, but with the face of a dog. It even had the same lengths that a person does, and not bent like a dog's. In fact, its entire physique 
was that of a human, just covered in thick hair, kind of like a bear. When I got home and told my parents, once I'd promised that I had not been drinking or smoking weed or anything, they rationalized that it must have been a bear just because of the size. I'm not 100% sure that wasn't no bear. Maybe a yeti. I honestly don't know. What I do know is that I added an hour onto my journey back to college to avoid that particular stretch of road. And if you want to call this a misidentification, I'm here to tell you that when I drove by, I got a good look at the face and I know what bears look like. That by no means was the face of a bear, nor the head. Its shape was very unique compared to that of a bear and resembled far more a canine than it did an actual bear. I hope this clears up any discrepancies that my story might give you. Although I have never seen a cryptid or anything like that, I do remember this one that happened when I went camping with my parents and my two older brothers when I was just a kid. My parents always put it down to us winding each other up and having overactive imaginations and reading far too much goosebumps, but we know what we heard. And just a few months ago, now that we are all adults, my mother finally admitted to us that she had heard it too, but had pretended not to so as to keep us from having nightmares. Not that it worked. I dreamt about that noise for years, and even more so, what made that noise. But anyway, so, it was just a typical campsite near some woods, and we were pitched there for just a couple of nights. Things had been great, for the most part. We'd climbed trees, played baseball, told stories, and enjoyed campfire food and fun. You know, s'mores, hot dogs, junk food. The essentials that many kids live on when camping. It was the second of nights when I woke up, desperate to go pee. Now, I wasn't a scaredy cat, but also, I was only nine, and it was pitch black outside. My brothers and I were in one tent, mom and dad in the other. Mom had pleaded with us that if we had to go pee in the woods during the night, we at least go over to the trees, so she wasn't stepping or smelling our urine the next morning. My brothers, we'll call them Luke and Justin, were both fast asleep, and I was of course not wanting to wake them. So, I began to fumble my way out of the tent. Of course, I stumbled and managed to trip over Luke, who bolted up and gave me a death stare for waking him. You know how older brothers are. But they weren't bad brothers, and he said since he was awake now anyway, he'd keep watch of the tent flap for me. I hurried out, and just as I was finished and about to run back is when I heard the sound. A howl. But... And this is the important and freaky part. It tapered off into more like a scream. Can you even imagine just how frightening, terrifying it was? Thank God I finished my flow, or I swear, I would have pissed all over myself. As it was, I then raced back into the tent, knocking Luke over again in the process. Looking at his wide eyes, I knew he had heard it too. I mean, how couldn't you have? It was so loud. What was, I was about to ask when we heard it again. Part howl, part scream. It was like it started off as a really low-pitched howl, kind of like a wolf, and then changed halfway through the scream of the duration into this deep, guttural human scream. And the scream, by the way, lasted at least 10 seconds. What the hell had the kind of lung power to make that noise? Luke was shaking by now. Even though he was only 11, he was always the most sensitive of all of us. 
we've got another fright. Then as Justin appeared right behind us and whispered, what the hell was that? So he had heard it too. Zipping up the tent, we all huddled together. Luke tried not to cry, as I whispered as quietly as I could what had happened. Justin was 12, and our biggest brother and hero, but even he looked genuinely petrified. We couldn't think of a single creature or animal that could make up such a horrendous noise. Then, we heard some snuffling and movement right outside of the tent. I honestly, hand on heart, thought we were all about to die. Luke could not cope anymore and let out an ear-piercing scream, almost matching that which we had heard outside. Of course, that was enough to wake mom and dad. And the next thing we knew, the tent was being unzipped by my dad in his PJs, looking not the happiest. Once they realized how scared we were, and that it wasn't some elaborate prank, we all slept piled into one tent. Well, I say slept, although I'm not sure anyone actually did. More like we just waited until the sun came up and drove out of there. For years after, mom and dad said it was most likely some sort of wild female dog, that they can make a screaming noise when they are searching for a mate. Keep in mind, my parents are far from any sort of biology degree, so I always like to give my mom crap for it, like she just pulled the answer out of her butt. And as I said, it is only recently that mom finally admitted they did in fact believe us. And the reason was, as they heard Luke scream, my dad quickly turned on his powerful torch, which was right next to him, and the light reflected a shadow just outside the tent for just a second. And that shadow was as tall as a man. But the thing that scared my father the most, and he will even argue now, that it must just have been a trick of the light. The thing that shook him up the most was the shape of the shadow's head. Because just for that fleeting moment, it resembled a dog. I thought that I would for sure be sending you a story related to UFOs and aliens. But that was before the story had finished unfolding. I'm a long-time listener, and I love your show. I can't say I've ever fancied encountering any of the things that you report on. It's my good pleasure and my misfortune to be submitting this experience of mine to you. I own a very small farm in the rural areas of Indiana. Describing the landscape would be pointless. You look in any direction and there's corn. Big surprise. Maybe enough open space for a road, but your view is dominated by corn. That's it. People like me make some extra room for hogs and cattle. A few will even have some sheep which isn't me. I'm an army of one. This last winter, I came outside to a massacre in the pasture. I don't think there are bears here in Indiana. I mean, I think there might be black bears, but nothing large enough to do this kind of damage. It looked like a bear had gotten in among the cows and torn several of them apart. They weren't just ripped open, like a pack of wolves descending upon a weak animal and ripping their guts out. They were, and this may not be the right word, dismantled. Joints were severed and ripped. Heads removed. Ribs were cracked and splayed open. Almost like that blood eagle thing that the Vikings used to do. Internal organs were ground up or tossed every which way, just like dirty laundry. It was the kind of violence you look at, and you think that there was more to it than some wild-looking thing just for a meal. It looked like the sort of thing that a crazed drug addict would do during an overdose. It was intelligent carnage. Does that even make any sense? Anyway, 
You get the picture. Most of the herd was untouched, but they were very spooked and acted nervous. They were looking at me warily, as if another new threat could possibly come from me. That was my clue that it had been a human and not an animal that had done this to my cows, especially the way my cows looked at me. This meant that I would have to check the cattle regularly now that I've sighted, and that would be more time that I did not have to take away from my other daily chores. Walking away at regular intervals to burn precious time, checking to see if there's something for me to shoot in the pasture. Days passed, and my vigil turned up nothing. No cattle thief or poachers. No meth heads. No back alley butchers in training, trying to sneak in some extra credit. And of course, no space aliens or UFOs, or little green-gray men. Of course, it was when I decided not to keep up on my patrolling that something happened. Four of my cows were shredded and strewn everywhere. I was honestly at a point where I would either have to start living next to the pasture in a tent or pay someone to be my cow security guard. Chores were now piling up and the time it took to be checking in with my moomoos every 15 to 20 minutes was really becoming unrealistic. I found a middle ground and I bought a trail cam. I would best be able to take care of the problem if I got a good look at the problem itself. For all I knew, my cows were spontaneously combusting and I was just chasing shadows. It would be another week before I found more of my cows looking like they had been falling into a blender. I checked the trail cam and it had indeed been tripped. So, I took the box out and had a look. It was bad enough that every animal that appears on the trail cam has glowing eyes. The thing that glared back at me with two eyes and as bright as campfires is something that I see in my dreams these days and I probably will for the rest of my life. It looked like a wolf, but it didn't walk like a wolf. It had the posture of a man, meaning it walked on two legs and even held its arms out in a sinister grace of stealth. To think that such a thing has the freedom and the audacity to roam my land and prey upon my precious animals. It was a whole new level of fear to see this creature, this beast so close to where I sleep. Judging by the way it stood next to the old oak tree, it was easily eight or nine feet tall what I would consider an absolute monster. It made me wonder if my shotgun would have any stopping power against something like that. That's where the story finds me now, as I write it to you. I think I'll be looking to hire a few hands, specifically for an armed night watch. If anything comes of it, I'll submit to you an update. The only thing that I like more than hiking is, of course, going off the beaten path. I get a thrill off of discovery, and even though man has dominated all but few corners of the wilderness, there's always still something new to see within the boundaries of a timber. I've been hiking the same forest in Montana for years, and I always end up seeing something new, or that things grow in such a way that they look new. Every year, every season, offers a different perspective. This last month, I'm pretty sure I actually found something that I'd never stumbled onto before. You see, I fell. The earth under my feet must not have been able to support me, and I fell into this cavity in the soil. It wasn't like I fell into a super deep pit of doom, Indiana Jones style. The top was only a few feet above my head. Once I was sure that I hadn't broken anything, I felt like a child that had discovered a cave of wonders. It takes a lot to phase me, and I started seeing things that made me feel 
apprehensive. I fired at my cell phone's LED. The very first thing it revealed was bones. All kinds. Some of which didn't have any business being here in the forest. I know I saw the skulls of cattle, mixed among the squirrel and deer, and even fox bones. And there were several sets of canine bones, and that immediately made me wonder what sort of animal had this collection. If even canine, more than likely wolf, wasn't the apex predator, it didn't seem like the place a bear would bed down. I did the foolish thing and kept looking around, delving into the darkness, brandishing my pistol, just in case. Besides the bones, I think I saw the most rudimentary forms of habitual dwelling. Skins and furs, serving as crude blankets and bedding. A bone that had been gnawed down, and to a point, like it could serve as some sort of implement. The tunnel opened underneath a hill, and I was free. My instincts told me to turn around and take one last look before going. I'm glad I did. I may not be alive to write this if I hadn't. An animal that walked on two legs was trotting toward me in that manner. That told me this was meant to be the killing blow. I don't know how long it had stalked me from paces away when I was probing around its suspected home. I can tell you that I remember saliva stringing down from its long fangs, and its dull amber eyes were full of malice. There was nothing human about this. It resembled a large wolf and a man, like some sort of unholy union of a hybrid. But the intensity in those eyes seemed more than the basic kill or be killed programming that one sees in dumb, brute animals. I didn't allow the shock of this thing's sight to paralyze me. I quickly thought and fired two shots in its knee and its stomach. It certainly didn't kill it, but the pain seemed to change its mind about coming any closer to me. It gave me one last baleful look before hobbling off, still fast enough to close in and kill. The monster consumed my thoughts for the rest of the day, prompting me to sit down and send you this. I can't tell you if I had encountered a very intelligent animal or a very stupid human. My skin tingles at the idea that these creatures had been a mere few feet away from me under the ground all these years while I roamed the woods. I don't care to meet one again. I'm no Jane Goodall, but the sheer wonder and terror of the natural world, if those things are indeed natural. I don't have much money but I own a little bit of land with thicker timber. I keep a camper right next to a small, peaceful pond, and that's my getaway when the real-world problems just become too much to take. Sometimes, I'll live out there for weeks at a time, and troubles just seem to be a million miles away when you are sleeping in the heart of nature like that. I kind of got schooled on just how close trouble really is in a nice sanctuary like that. I was getting ready for another stretch of camping. I had gotten a bunch of food and other things and brought it out to the trailer. I would organize it all later on. I still had some things back at the homestead to wrap up before I disappeared. I couldn't have been gone from the trailer for more than late morning to late afternoon. But that was more than enough time for something to happen so that when I showed up, all ready to settle in, it looked like hell dropped a cherry bomb in my toilet. You can see all the way to the mirror when you first open the trailer door, and it was shattered. This was my first hint that not all was well. Then, I saw the way all my clothes and bedding was thrown everywhere. And it wasn't just thrown. It was shredded. Somebody was out to do damage. All the new food I just bought was open and painted onto the walls and carpet. 
I was getting fighting mad when I noticed the canned goods. I'm a strong man, but not even I can crush a can of beans and cause the insides to be spurting outwards. Every last can I'd bought looked like it had been crushed in the palm of somebody huge and crazy strong. That didn't quite add up with me. I nearly pictured somebody with a tool going around, pinching, and bursting all the cans. But that wouldn't make any sense. A little bit of fear and confusion was starting to keep my anger company. I went into what was left of the bedroom and reached under the mattress. My revolver was still there. I just spent the early evening sitting in the doorway of that trailer, waiting for the ransacker to come back. Anyone that causes that much destruction but doesn't take the gun has got to be coming back. I was now starting to doubt if it was a person. But other than bears, what kind of animal has the strength to crush and burst canned goods? I began to doze when a snapping twig made me sit bolt upright. I generally believe in demons from hell all my life, but that was the closest I had ever come to seeing one in the flesh. Damn thing straight up looked like a werewolf, but much more sinister than anything I ever saw in a movie. Its fur was both black and brown, and those ears, man, looked like the devil's horns if I had ever dreamt up such a notion. I thought it was walking on its hind legs when I noticed its legs were built for being walked on. The monster had actual legs and actual arms, you tell me that ain't straight out of Revelations. I could see twisted metal stuck between its teeth from my cans of food. We locked eyes for a long time, its breath billowing in clouds of vapor with a little grunt each time. It was then that I pointed my gun straight at it and hoped it was smart enough to get the message. It wasn't. It could tell something was up but it didn't quite get the notion of an armed and pissed off American. So hey, my wall was due for a good trophy. I aimed right between its eyes and pulled the trigger three times. The first slugged stunned it. The second and third made bits of bone and meat fly up. I was waiting for it to fall back and die, but it didn't. It ran off, hit a tree in the process and kept going. When all the adrenaline had worn off, my stubborn bravery went with it. I have no plans of ever going back out to that trailer to sleep alone. What am I, crazy? That would be a death sentence. What that monster did to those cans, it could have easily done to the trailer walls. Just open the entire thing up like a sardine can and eat me alive while I'm snuggled in my bed. I'll keep the 12 gauge within my arm's reach at all times from now on. And maybe you can answer me, what exactly in the hell am I dealing with here? Once, and only once, did I get the chance to be a part of a dig site at the ruins of a Mayan temple in Honduras. I was all over that. After all the business with 2012, and the Mayan calendar. I was hooked, to say the least. So, I readily took the invitation without a thought or second of hesitation. The director of the dig was going to focus less on the ruins above ground and take a closer look at what could be beneath the ground. He didn't think it likely that the Mayans just kept their secrets out in the open so he wanted to probe underneath, wherever there might be crypts and secret storage. His intuition did not disappoint. We discovered three more crypts than what had originally been discovered, all of them cleverly hidden. It took months to move the dirt and rocks out while preserving the precious stonework. Things got even more interesting when we started unearthing walls and tablets that had consistent depictions of something that looked like it was borrowed from ancient Egypt. 
bipedal wolves were shown in carvings to be corralling, almost shepherding groups of people. There were some indications that they were supposed to be criminals. I could picture an ancient society throwing criminals to wolves, but we were all tripping over the depiction of the wolves walking just like humans. Someone suggested that it was a visual metaphor, an executioner having wolf-like traits, but there were too many relief carvings of these same depictions. There was nothing with the familiar wolf that walks on all fours. The matter came to a head when we uncovered a door in the floor, a heavy stone slab that was utterly covered in depictions of the same man-wolf. The mechanism that allowed the door to open was in fact intact. Once the lock was removed, it took only one finger to make the door slide open, thanks to some sophisticated ancient ball-bearing system. Stairs descended into a depth none of us could really make out. The director volunteered himself and two others to go down and investigate. I was appalled that I wasn't chosen, but the director argued that somebody had to make sure it was safe first. I waited in front of the yawning doorway, eager to have my own turn. At length, I heard a sound that curdled my blood. A long, echoing howl drifted out of the opening, as if it were coming from very far away. Several others followed. It was easily the eerie sensation, and the whole of my skin prickled. A while later, the director and only one of his companions would come, racing out of the hole, wide-eyed. He gibbered about how we needed to close the doorway and seal it immediately. When I refused, he punched me in the jaw and did the job himself. I was far too stunned from the punch to hit him back. Everything else happened far too quickly for anybody to react. The expedition was abandoned. Records thrown away, quote-unquote, disappeared. Though I'm sure the director didn't destroy them. They were more than likely ceased. Everyone was ordered home, and those that couldn't cut their trip short were put up in hotels until they could leave appropriately. I wanted answers. I couldn't get a hold of a single person to get any. The director changed all of his contact information, Facebook information from the few people I had gotten to know at the dig site, well, vanished. The entire thing was covered up. I know you were hoping for some big story about a real life monster encounter, but I wasn't given my chance. That howling that I had heard rising up from that secret vault, that was no air movement. I'm thoroughly convinced that was something very much wolf or dog related. I can only guess what spooked the director and claimed one of our associates. I thought that was rather cold of him to just leave without the third man, but maybe there wasn't anything left to go back for. I would have brought it up with the law if the entire expedition hadn't vanished into thin air and any trace of the trip on record or paper now gone. I later wondered if the authorities knew more than I ever would and if they helped in making it look like there was never an expedition. Now, I'm far away out of that job field and I pursue other areas in life, leaving that in the past where I feel it belongs. I'm a sanitation worker. You'd be amazed at how much the local wildlife becomes part of the ecology of a landfill. Buzzards, coyotes, sometimes wolves, and even the occasional bear will show up to see what edibles have been left behind by humans. I have an entire Instagram account devoted to the wildlife I can photograph. Junkyards are all that pretty but it seems like a wasted opportunity, no pun intended. One early morning, I thought I had scored a good view on the biggest and most dangerous looking black wolf that I had ever laid my eyes upon. It was by itself on a hill of trash, gnawing 
on the cadaver of a deer. I got out my camera and everything as he just stayed there like a good boy. Once I got everything mounted on a tripod and got the wolf in my viewfinder, the creature, well, stood up. I thought I was going to find out that one of my coworkers had pranked me and he'd turn around and I'd see him wearing a wolf Halloween costume. But when he turned around, there was no laughing face of my friend. There was just the wolf's face, the eyes alive with a light that made my spirit shrivel up like a raisin. I quickly snapped back to my senses, fumbled for the camera, wanting to capture evidence of this sighting. For the first time since owning that camera, it wouldn't take. I cursed at it and exclaimed. The monster just stood there like it knew what was happening, as if it were amused. Then, the camera just died. The wolf, or whatever it was, let out a shuddering, guttural growl that almost sounded like a laugh, a mocking taunt. Looking back, I realized that it could have attacked me, and I wouldn't have been able to put up an ounce of a fight. Maybe the deer satiated it. Maybe it wanted to hang around. Of course, nobody now believes me when I tell them this story. So, I'm sending it to you, in hopes you can give me some answers.